Okay, so today we're going to talk about vineyard establishment. Um, this is should help you guys out uh, pretty well on your uh, uh, wine styles project. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about site selection first, uh, and then so how we go about actually selecting the site for the grapes for the wine styles we're trying to achieve. Uh, or sometimes we even just select sites and then go about selecting the grapes and everything and deciding upon the wine style just based off of the site. Uh, and then we're going to talk about planning, how we actually go and um, plan the site out, and then how we actually go about prepping and planting the site. Okay. So one of the first things you have to consider when doing site selection, uh, of course, is market. So for instance, what I have right here on the slide is, you know, would we potentially want to do the North Willamette Valley in Oregon? Uh, or the Umqua Valley in Oregon, uh, which is kind of south central Oregon. Um, you know, there's there's real considerations that you have to have. One, one is, uh, of course, the land up in the North Willamette Valley um, is going to be much higher priced than in the Umqua Valley because simply North Willamette is um, kind of a bigger brand, regional brand. Uh, also, it's close to Portland, uh, so it's close to markets. Um, and, and then also in the Umqua, you're going to fetch lower prices for fruit if you're going to be doing contract farming. Um, so those are all things you have to consider. Um, so if you look at this, for instance, this is the price for North Willamette fruit uh, for Pinot Noir. It's around twenty-six to $3,000 a ton average. Um, and the yields are about 2.5 tons per acre. So in the Umqua Valley, uh, they are farming Pinot and selling it for around $2,000 a ton and then cropping it at around the same yield. Uh, so the net revenue for North Willamette Farm is somewhere roughly around $7,000, uh, which, by the way, the, the average farming costs are around five to $7,000 per acre. Um, and that's just for operational costs. Um, so... You can see, really, you're only getting in the North Willamette. You're only getting about, um, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars an acre uh, in profit many times. Um, and then we can see here in the the the, uh, the Umqua, their average revenue is somewhere uh, around five, maybe six thousand dollars an acre. Um, so in many cases, if they are actually selling that fruit uh, to other wineries, uh, they actually may be losing money. However, uh, in the Umqua, you can go ahead and crop Pinot Gris uh, much higher because of this perception by winemakers that uh, it doesn't really matter what you crop Pinot Gris at, but if you but you need to crop Pinot Noir at a low uh, at a low yield in order to fetch high quality. Of course, that's an oversimplification of the yield quality relationship, uh, but that is a common commonly held belief in Oregon and really in the uh, um, luxury Pinot market. Um, but again, for, for your, for your projects, you need to think critically about yields. Um, you know, don't just say we're going to crop at a low yield because somebody says it makes high quality wine. You really need to start thinking critically about yields. And we're going to talk about yields and yield components and, um, the relationship between yield and quality, uh, in a later class. So anyways, with Pinot Gris uh, in, the, in the Umqua, you can see we can crop that at, you know, around six cents per acre. Uh, we're selling it for significantly less than Pinot. However, because of that higher yield that we were able to crop it at in the Umqua, we can fetch higher revenues. So in the Umqua, perhaps it would be more advantageous uh, for us to be farming Pinot Gris uh, because we're going to get more money for it. Um, however, of course, we need markets for the Pinot Gris, which we may or may not have. So, of course, a big thing that goes into site selection is climate. Um, so, we try to look at the uh, the meso and microclimate. Um, so, the meso climate would be like the climate of like a region, kind of like an area, uh, and then a microclimate is, is actually defined as the climate in the uh, like canopy itself, essentially. 
So one thing that we're looking for is frost-free days. Uh, so we need, we're shooting for about 150 to 190 frost-free days um, because we need to get ripe, of course. Um, and then we're also shooting for um, a, like a minimum number of heat units uh, for a particular variety. So for instance, for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, table wines, uh, we're going to need about at least 1,800 growing degree days uh, to get those ripe during the during the season. Um, and yeah, we want also a low chance of winter damage. Uh, as you should remember from 1104, we can, temperatures can get very low uh, in some areas and that can cause severe winter damage to grapevines and actually kill them out. Um, so that is something that is, uh, happens on a re relatively regular basis uh, in the major growing regions uh, on the eastern seaboard, so Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York, uh, as well as in the Midwest. Um, so that's, of course, something we, we really don't want to happen uh, because it can cause massive economic issues. So that's one thing we need to, to consider is what are the, uh, the winter lows uh, and then if they are very low, then do we need to consider other varieties potentially, like hybrids, which are more uh, cold hardy? And then even within the hybrids, there's varying degrees of cold hardiness, right? So there's those University of Minnesota hybrids like Marquette uh, and Frontenac, which can deal with quite cold, uh, severe winter temperatures. And actually, many of the the Cornell hybrids aren't aren't that cold hardy. They're, they're certainly not as cold hardy as the Minnesota hybrids because in Minnesota, they're actually breeding specifically uh, for those vines to withstand those cold winter temperatures. So, and then the other thing we're looking for is, you know, if we're in areas like marginal areas of grape growth, do we have bodies of water uh, that could potentially modify the mesoclimate? Um, because large bodies of water can act as sort of heat reservoirs, heat sinks. So the heat is absorbed by the um, by the water during the day. Uh, the body of water heats up, and then at night it releases that heat, uh, and then would slightly raise the temperature around the body of water, um, you know, ever so slightly, which can actually have a significant. While it's a, you know a slight increase in temperature, that can have a significant impact on uh, frost risk potential. So areas like the Okanagan Valley in, uh, in British Columbia, um, this area, so this is uh, Lake Kelowna. And by the way, this is north of 50 degrees north latitude. So if you guys remember from 1104, we talked about the Great Belt, which is 30 to 50 degrees uh, north and south in latitude. Um, and the reason we see grape growing predominantly done in that, what we call the, the wine belt or the grape belt, is because if you go below 30 degrees in latitude, you start getting into tropical areas. It starts, it's too warm. Grape vines don't shut down. Um, you have like summer rains. And then if you get above 50 degrees north uh, or south, then it gets too cold. The day lengths get too short. Um, yeah, so this region here uh, is above 50 degrees north. Um, but the reason it works is because it's on this big lake. Um, it, otherwise, if this lake wasn't here, this is Lake Kelowna. If this lake wasn't here, this grape growing region would not exist, or at least they wouldn't be growing um, uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which they've become quite famous for. And then here's Wanaka, New Zealand. Uh, this is in Central Otago, New Zealand. Um, this is the most southerly grape growing region in the world. There actually may be another one now in Chile that might be slightly farther south. Um, but for a very long time, this was <clears throat> the most southerly grape growing region in the world. Um, this area here in Wanaka uh, also would probably not be suitable for grapes. There, this vineyard here gets does get impacted by frost uh, on a regular basis. And most vineyards in central Otago have to deal with frost every year. Um, but one of the things that really helps this vineyard out is Lake Wanaka here. 
the large heat sink. They're right on the water, uh, and you're getting less frost certainly in these in these lower blocks than you would up here in the uh, in the upper blocks. The other thing that's beneficial for this vineyard is you're on a hill uh, and you're sloping down into the lake, so air moves down down the hill into the lake as well. So you're not getting like air ponding, uh, cold air ponding. So one thing to look at uh, when we are looking for sites is also look at average growing season temperature. Uh, and we can use that to kind of guide as well the, the varieties we're gonna plant. Um, this was something, this chart is a pretty famous chart put together by um, a researcher who used to be based out of Southern Oregon University. Now he is uh, at Linfield College in McMinnville, Oregon in the Willamette Valley. Um, but this is, and while I, of course, am from Oregon, uh, I'm not showing you this because, you know, whatever, home state pride or something. It, uh, this is a very famous chart. He's a quite well-known uh, researcher in the area of um, climate and uh, grape growing. Um, and what this is showing is average growing season temperature. And then if we go down here, like, uh, it, where where it intersects. So like if you have an average growing season temperature of 59 to 63, uh, then potentially grapes like Pinot Gris, Gewurz, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Simeon, maybe some Cabernet Franc, uh, maybe those would be potentially good varieties to grow. Uh, I would say maybe Tem Tempranillo would be on the warmer end, of course. So you're, you're here maybe... We're talking about an average growing season temperature for Tempranillo of maybe around 62 degrees-ish. Uh, Dolcetto is going to be definitely on the higher end of this segment, so probably around 63 degrees. Um, and then the bar itself represents the estimated span of the ripening time for that fruit. Uh, so some grape varieties, after Veraison, they get ripe pretty quickly, uh, and some take a longer time. So like you can see here, Pinot Noir has a pretty short ripening period. Uh, so basically, once we get to one with Pinot, when we get to 100% uh, Veraison, uh, we're generally harvesting for still Pinot Noir um, about 30 days after full Veraison. Uh, but Riesling, you know, will take about 60 days. It takes quite a long time to ripen Riesling. So in the, the North Bolivia Valley, uh, for instance, so the North Willamette Valley falls somewhere. I think the average growing season temperature is around 60 degrees. So it'd be like here. Um, and so you can see we're going right through Riesling and Pinot. Uh, but in the North Willamette, the Pinot will ripen quicker than the Riesling. So the Pinot will actually come in the door first uh, relative to the Riesling. The Riesling in the North Willamette is usually some of the last fruit to actually come in. Um, and definitely if, if people have Tempranillo in the North Willamette, and some people do, that that would be the last fruit. Um, so that's one thing to consider is average growing season temperatures. And then, of course, another thing we need to consider is growing degree days. And this is something that all grape growers look at. Uh, this is one of our most common measures. And this is a like a heat summation index, essentially. Uh, and we look at heat accumulation throughout the growing season. And it's used to predict plant development to some extent. Uh, because phenological events kind of line up with GDDs relatively well. Um, not super accurate, but it's okay. And um, yeah, so the higher the GDDs for a growing region, the more, like the warmer it is, right? Because it's heat summation. And what it is, is it's just a calculation of the average temperature for a day minus this base temperature that we consider kind of the the, uh, the biological minimum for uh, growth of the grapevine. And that temperature for us is 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. Um, it's, of course, that's an oversimplification. Uh, grapevines are uh, biologically active below 50 degrees. Uh, and we see, like, for instance, bud break, we see bud break below 50 degrees. Um, but we need some sort of base temperature in order for this to work. So it's roughly it's roughly correct, and, and that's what we use. Uh, and then we calculate um, growing degree days for a region for the growing season. Um, so that would be on in the northern hemisphere. That's from April 1st 
to the end of October. Uh, and then in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the opposite. It's from October 1st um, to the end of uh, March. So this is how it's calculated. So it's um, maximum plus minimum temperature. This is, so this is to give you the average uh, temperature of a day. So you take the maximum temperature of the day plus the minimum temperature of a day. So the, in this case, that's 150 divided by two. Uh, then that's 75. Then we subtract 50. So that's 25 growing degree days for this particular day. Okay. So also, you can pull average temperatures for days off of some weather stations, and you can just use those. And of course, that's going to be more accurate than doing this. Uh, but this gives you a, a pretty good idea of the average temperature as well. So there it is all worked out for you. So, you know, if we look at this one, for instance, like maximum temperature is 50, the minimum temperature is 40. Uh, so that's 90. Uh, when we add them together, divided by two is 45. And then we subtract 50. So then we have negative five um, GDDs. So we can't have negative GDDs, right? So what we're talking about is heat summation because plants don't, they just grow or they stagnate in growth. Uh, they don't go backwards in growth, right? So if it's a negative number, it's actually just going to be a zero. We, we actually, in this case, on this day, we've accumulated zero growing degree days, okay? So essentially saying, okay, the plant hasn't really grown today. So here's one way in which we can look at growing degree days, uh, and this is a very common way to kind of graph out GDDs um, and just look at heat summation over a growing season. And so this is for, I've done this for a few key regions. Um, this here, obviously Champaign, Willamette Valley in Oregon, Sonoma, this is the north coast of California. And this Barberry is, um, it's actually a town, it's close to Chablis. Um, so I use this kind of as a, uh, um, like a Chablis analog, basically. It's, it's only about 30 miles away from Chablis, so I have a feeling it's, it's very close in terms of um, temperature. It might be slightly warmer than Chablis. Um, but what you're seeing here is long-term averages. Uh, so where I've taken like multiple years and averaged the growing degree days for each day uh, and then, s then made a summation of them so you can see it growing over time. Uh, of course, Champagne here is not a very smooth line, and that's because there's not many years of data that are going into the Champagne long-term average. Um, I think this only has about six years of data, and that's where you're, you're going to see, you know, the, the jumps. Um, but, of course, some of these, I have quite a lot of data, so you have quite smooth, smooth lines. So... This is just one way like we can compare regions. Um, so here we can see that in Sonoma, it warms up much faster in the spring than these other areas, um, you know, which might indicate that these other areas are probably more prone to spring frosts than Sonoma is, uh, which is certainly true. Um, Willamette Valley, though, however, is not actually that prone to spring, spring frost. So you'd have to dig down a little bit deeper into the data to really start to look at frost risks. Um, but yeah, the Willamette Valley doesn't really tend to get many frosts um, unless you have vineyards in positions in the landscape where cold air dams up. Um, but Champaign and uh, Chablis definitely get actually quite a bit of spring frost issues. Um, so, and then you see that Sonoma just continues to be very warm throughout the, the growing season relative to these other, these other regions. Um, you know, and remember Sonoma also makes a lot of Pinot Noir. So does Willamette Valley. Uh, so the Pinots are probably going to be quite different between the Willamette Valley and Sonoma because that there's this quite large differential in uh, heat. So then we can break our regions up into what we call Winkler regions. And these are kind of, um, these were developed in 1946 by some UC Davis researchers uh, to classify grape growing regions based on their growing degree days. And then by doing that, we can kind of understand, you know, what varieties might work well where and uh, what issues we might face and that sort of thing. So the 
lower number regions uh, are the cooler regions and the higher number regions are the hotter regions. So you can see 1A. 1A is really kind of the more marginal growing regions. Um, like you can see Champagne, which is, I would say, one of the most marginal growing regions in the world. Uh, and that's why we make Champagne there because uh, we're shooting for high acids in the base wines um, and we're not really shooting for varietal character. Um, then you can see we go up into 1B, which is a much less marginal areas, um, still kind of prone to some spring frosts uh, and even fall frosts um, in Marlboro and, and Burgundy, not so much in the Willamette Valley. Uh, then we move, and so this is kind of like Pinot, Chardonnay country um, in region one. Region two, we start getting into kind of cooler climate Syrahs and uh, Bordeaux Reds. Uh, definitely the cooler climate Bordeaux, uh, including Bordeaux itself. Uh, and then region three, we start getting into the warmer climate Syrahs. Um, we get into a little bit of Tempranillo uh, and maybe some Zinfandel with Sonoma. We can start getting Zin ripe. Um, of course, we can we can get anything that we can get ripe in regions one and two. We can also get ripe in region three. So there's, of course, Pinot Noir and Sonoma as well. Um, and then moving to region four, we're getting into the warmer climate Bordeaux. Uh, so Napa, of course, it's quite a bit warmer um, than Bordeaux. Uh, the Southern Rhone, this is Grenache country. Um, so Grenache needs quite a bit of heat to get ripe. Um, Morvedra as well. Uh, we also have Sangiovese. And then now we get into region five, which is very hot. So we get Hunter Valley, we're talking about very hot climate Shiraz. Um, Lodi, uh, which grows a bit of everything, really. Um, yeah, and uh, also some hot climate Malbecs as well coming out of Mendoza. Um, so this is kind of like Central Valley territory here, big bulk pre produ uh, production. And so then we can start breaking down, uh, you know, what grapes fit where. So, you know, these grapes would be pretty good for most regions one and two, um, depending, right? like Viognier, would probably be more for region two. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc would be maybe more region two. We could probably get it ripe in region one. Um, and then, yeah, we look, we go over here to the, these are, and those are also early ripeners. Uh, this, so this also has to do with ripening length as well. Um, then we get in ourselves into regions two and three here uh, where we can get some of these things ripe. And then these kind of mid ripeners mostly are grown in region threes and fours. Um, of course, Riesling, uh, we can get that ripe in region twos. Um, so this isn't exactly a you know perfect chart, of course, but we go over here to these late ripeners and these late ripeners need quite a lot of heat to get ripe. So these are things that we find in the Central Valley a lot. Um, so remember Ruby Red and Muscat of Alexandria, these are two of the top 10 grapes grown in the United States by acreage uh, and probably by gallons as well produced. And these are grapes that are, um, we found we find almost exclusively in the Central Valley of California. You need a lot of heat to get them ripe. Right, and so then another thing we need to look at about uh, with regards to climate is precipitation. Uh, and specifically, not, not just how much falls, uh, but when that rain falls. Um, so here we're looking at Champagne, Ithaca, Sonoma, and Montpellier. And Montpellier is uh, in the um, kind of northern part, northeastern part of uh, the Languedoc, Roussillon, uh, Appalachian in France. Um, and what we see here, let's start with Sonoma because it's the most dramatic uh, Sonoma, Sonoma actually does get quite a bit of rainfall, but um, it drops out from uh, basically April until October. You have this quite nice uh, long dry period during the growing season. And that's great for uh, fungal disease prevention, right? Because we don't, we don't have all that, that uh, free water and um, humidity in the fruit zone to exacerbate fungal disease issues. Uh, but of course we're going to have quite dry soil during the growing season. Uh, and especially if we have a, you know, a thin 
well drained, um, you know, yeah, thin soil that doesn't with a little bit of organic matter that doesn't hold a lot of water. Uh, we're not going to be retaining a lot of that water from the winter time, and our soil is going to be get quite dry in July and August, and our vine is going to go into severe water stress. Um, so, if we see a rainfall pattern like this, uh, we may start to have to consider using uh, irrigation to supplement water. You know, probably sometime in between like May and uh, August, right? But then we, if we look at these other growing regions, so here's Ithaca here, which would be the Finger Lakes on the top. And you can see in the Finger Lakes, we're getting, you know, most, like the most of our precipitation actually occurs in the growing season, which of course is problematic for fungal disease, uh, which shouldn't, you know, surprise any of you uh, living here in Ithaca. Uh, many of us have fungal pathogens surviving in our houses. Um, but you can see this, you know, pretty even three to four inches of rain uh, every month during the growing season here, right? So here, and also here, we have soils that have high water holding capacity. Um, you know, they have 5% organic matter, which is quite a lot. Uh, and they can be, a lot of these soils can be um, over six feet deep, which is also, which is quite a deep soil. Uh, and they can be like clay loams, which hold uh, quite a lot of water. So, so here you may not need to use irrigation. And if you do have to use irrigation, it may only be like once or twice, uh, during drought moments, uh, which generally I think occur around July in this area. Uh, and the same thing is true of champagne. You see, it's about two inches every month. Uh, and, they don't irrigate uh, in Champagne because because of this. Um, same thing with Languedoc. Uh, the Languedoc is dries out. Um, it's not like so. Champagne and, and Ithaca have even rainfall across the season. Um, of course, Ithaca is quite a bit more than Champagne. Um, but you can see the Languedoc does sort of dry out. Obviously, it does not dry out nearly as much as like Sonoma does, um, but it does. So here you may actually benefit from some irrigation sometime in July or August. Um, and in the long dock, I think as of 2014 uh, is when they legalized the use of irrigation, uh, but it is controlled by the AOC and they kind of tell you uh, when you can use it and when you can't. Um, by the way, if you're doing long dock in your project, uh, again, think about this critically. Uh, don't don't discuss the AOC rules. We want you to actually uh, think critically about how you're going to farm, rather than go off of AOC rules, which is largely governed by tradition, rather than uh, efficient production methods.